Well, welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged. Today, I want to dedicate the podcast to the COVID-19 outbreak all over the world. It is now a pandemic. And before I get into anything else, I want to mention that today's podcast was organized by Paradise for Kids Global. And that includes Father Themi's Orthodox mission in Sierra Leone. That's West Africa. And his work there is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet the needs of the poor in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A little bit about this mission, this mission called Paradise for Kids. This mission is dedicated to fulfill the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 25. The point here is to help those who are hungry, to feed those who do not have food, to take care of the thirst of those who do not have the basics of clean water, to clothe the naked, to care for the sick, to reach out to those who are forgotten by society, and to be good stewards in the vineyard of our Lord. Why? So that we can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, share your master's happiness. And on a personal note, let me say that many of you listening to my voice right now may recall that I almost died two times last year. And the one thing that I recognized when I came out of a coma last year in the month of June was the thought, did I do enough for those who are poor and downtrodden? If I had been ushered into the presence of the Lord, would I have done enough in his service? And I think that that very thought of taking care of the poor and downtrodden ought to be foremost in all of our thoughts. And it most certainly is foremost in the thoughts of Father Femi. He is one of the most interesting, informative, inspirational people on the planet. And in my book, he is and always will be a rock star. And let me give you a little sense of why I'm so excited to be talking to Father Themi about the novel coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic around the world. In the 60s, Father Themi was not a father, of course. He was part of a rock band called The Flies. And he was playing with the biggest names in rock. He was playing with people like the Rolling Stones. And The Flies were sort of an Australian takeoff from The Beatles, And during those rock and roll years, Father Themi had a mystical experience. And during that experience, he saw our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that led him to accept Christianity, but not only to accept the Christian faith, but to develop a thirst for the Bible, a thirst that was unquenchable. Well, Father Themi went on to complete a Master's of Education degree, and then to teach. But after reading the gospel over and over again, he decided to sell everything that he had to give to the poor. He walked some, as I understand it, a thousand miles from Melbourne to Brisbane, seeking God's will for his life. Well, his journey took him to studies in the United States to Holy Cross University, where he got a master's of theological studies, to Harvard Divinity School, and then to undertaking a master of theology at Princeton, and finally completing a PhD at Brown University. After spending a considerable amount of time teaching, Father Themi was led to act out his faith and to help the poor. He was a person who admired Mother Teresa. And he wanted to do what Mother Teresa had done with her life. And that led him to fill a great need in Africa. And so he began conducting liturgies and preaching in various 
places throughout Kenya, always with the same emphasis. And that was to teach about the poor and to help them not only with fish, but learning the discipline of catching fish so that they could feed their own. Some of Father Themi's works include building a preschool, a primary school, a high school, providing free education, food, clothing, and all for those who are poor and downtrodden. Back in 2007, Father Themi began a new mission. He moved from Kenya to Sierra Leone, then considered the poorest country in the world, may still be the poorest country in the world. And when asked why Sierra Leone, Father Themi's thought was, I want to start at the bottom and work our way up. Start with the poorest of the poor. Well, Father Themi has become a great friend when I contracted a dread disease, the worst of the lymphomas, stage four mantle cell lymphoma. He was one of the first people to call me. I remember receiving the call from West Africa and Father Themi praying with me over the phone. From then till now, he's been a great friend and someone that I admire greatly. And Father Themi, as always, it is great to have you on Hank Unplugged. Wow. (laughs) What an introduction. Woo. Thank you. Well, that summarizes your life. (laughs) Oh, wow. Wow. No problem. Thank you so much, Hank. God bless you. And you've done such a great work yourself. So we're all trying to repent of our sins and to reach the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. And I think this is something that you have laid on my heart from the standpoint of being an example. And as I just said in the introduction, It was quite something for me to have slipped into a coma in the hospital. So I got a transplant and then sort of a monkey wrench in the middle of the transplant as I contracted an E. coli bacterium. Mm -hmm. And as a result Mm -hmm. of that, I slipped into unconsciousness and lost three days of my life. But when I came to, I was pressed with that thought that has been the passion of your life. If I stand before Jesus Christ... And he asked Mm. me what I did for the poorest of the poor. What would I say? And Mm. that has been Mm. something that has stayed with me from the time that I started getting better, from the time Mm. that Mm. the transplant started working in my life. That thought has been with me. And I suppose you're at the epicenter of that thought because that has been your passion. Mm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, it has. It has. And I thank God for that, for putting it into my heart. And also, it is a means of, you know, of repentance as well, you know, by living in situations uh, far away from the comforts of the first world and uh, living with the poor. And the poor can be demanding. I mean, you know, a lot of the time I spend listening to their pains, listening to their demands, listening to their frustrations. And sometimes I can help, sometimes I can't help. You know, it can be very frustrating as well. But it's a kind of a spiritual safety zone to know that you are among the poorest of the poor and to know that, you know, Christ himself identified with them. So there's a kind of a security being in the turmoil, shall we call it, of the world of poverty. It's very painful, but I feel some comfort in it, some security in it, you know, because Christ identified with it so much. Talk about yourself for a moment, maybe uncomfortable, but you have suffered your own physical limitations. One of the things that I remember in spending time with you is the difficulty you have with your eyesight. Absolutely. I'm actually legally blind, and right now I'm facing another cross, if I may humbly. May God forgive me if it sounds like I'm boasting, but I don't mean to. I am blind. I am legally blind. I have, when I do church services, I have to you bring books in that are font, you know, 40. <laughs> Everybody else has got like font 11, right? I'm sort of font 45. <laughs> so, you know, in one page, I do like one verse, you know, but I've got used to that. But the other thing right now that is on my mind is that everything has stopped here in Sierra Leone, in West Africa. There is no way out. There's no way in. And because of my eyesight, I'm in the high risk of, what is known as retinal detachment. 
Now, in America or Australia, that would be nothing. And, you know, retinal detachment is where your eye sort of detaches the retina. And you've got four days to get to a doctor. If you don't, to an ophthalmologist, you get there, no problem. They'll put it, everything will be fine, right? But here, we don't have anybody that can do that. And I can't get out. So if I get this retinal detachment, I'm in the hands of God. So this is part of the cross that one has to bear in poverty, Mm. that we don't have the normal comforts and the normal availabilities that I would have in Australia or you have in America. I would say, Brother Hank, that had you been living here, you may not have been alive now. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. So there is some blessings, some consolation that you can take from that, that, you know, God has put you in a place that is where you're meant to be. You understand? I do understand. And, you know, one of the significant things I thought about when I thought about doing a podcast on the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, was the fact that you were in the epicenter of the Ebola crisis. I think the Correct. years were 2014 through 2016. And the Correct. epicenter of that Ebola crisis was West Africa. There are about 11,000 or more, as I recall, people who died during that crisis. Correct. And and I thought from that perspective, you could speak to Americans and people all over the world about the coronavirus and how we ought to yep. process that, not only as people, but also as the body of Christ. So maybe Correct. you can take us back to the time in which you were experiencing people dying in the streets around you. The time in which you were taking care of the poor and the downtrodden, the time in which you were not experiencing the kind of luxury that we have in America or in the West, but rather experiencing poverty in the midst of crisis. Correct. Can I just take it back a little bit? I do want to talk about... COVID-19 and to give some comfort and some advice, humble and unworthy as I may be. But I think I can give some small insight to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I am talking to brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? I want to make that very clear because I think someone who is not a brother or sister in Christ may not understand where I'm coming from and may, I may be misunderstood. So, I am talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. But Brother Hank, let me just take you back a little bit further. The world has always experienced epidemics. And COVID-19, it's actually a midget compared to some of the huge epidemics. I made a small list of them. Back in 165 AD, 20 million people died in the Roman Empire from smallpox. Around about... The Emperor Justinian's time, at about 6th century AD in the Byzantine Empire, 100 million people died of some kind of plague that hit them. The Black Death in Europe of 1331 killed 200 million, 200 million, right? The so-called coming of the conquistadores into the New World in Mexico, Peru, brought with them smallpox and brought with them a salmonella that killed of the local Aztec and Inca population 15 million. It wiped out the Inca civilization. It wiped out the native Indian civilizations. We're talking huge catastrophes, right? Going back to 1919, only 100 years ago, after the First World War, Spanish flu killed 100 million Europeans more than the First World War. So when you're looking at COVID-19 and even Ebola that we had here, you know, 13,000, I think 14,000 died. So far with COVID, 17,000 people have died. We're really not in the same league as what the world has suffered in the past with these extraordinary epidemics, okay? Now, Having said that, I'm not denying what is going on now. I'm not denying that. I'm saying, whoa, that's really terrible. But here is the difference. In Africa, 
we are kind of used to what the West would call unstable situations. We're used to civil wars. We are used to epidemics. We are used to afflictions, political instability. It's nothing new, okay? The problem with COVID-19 coming to America, coming to Europe, coming to Australia and Canada is that you are not ready for it. Psychologically, uh, mentally, maybe spiritually as well. This is a catastrophe. This is an apocalyptic catastrophe. But if you look at it from a historical perspective, it really isn't such a dramatic event as in the past. That's not to deny that it is dangerous. It is not to deny that it's something horrible. I'm not denying that. I'm putting it into a historical perspective and into a geographical perspective. The African people are more used to this. And, you know, after Ebola, we're very ready now for Corona. We're very ready. We know exactly what to do. We wash our hands. We don't touch each other. We know what to do. Nobody's in a panic. Even though the airports have closed down, there is no way out of here. Today, the doctors have said they're not going to treat anybody. They don't want to treat anybody. Medical professionals come to a stop here. And the reason for that is during the Ebola crisis, many doctors died and nurses died and, and they were not compensated. So they say now, why should we die when you don't compensate us? So they said, no, we're not going to treat anybody with corona. The only people we will treat are serious emergencies. If you're dying of, uh, you know, cancer, well, well, okay, we'll take you in. That's all. But so anybody who's sick now, well, take care of yourself. So we're going through that as well. So, but we're used to that. We're used to that. That's not, you know, we know what to do about, we'll go to the chemist. We will take care of ourselves. We're not going to panic because we don't have any doctors, you know, but if that was in New York, that would be catastrophe, psychological catastrophe. So you've got to look at it from a regional perspective as well. COVID-19 is a terrible, terrible virus, but the panic and the scare and the fear is unbelievable. Why? Why such fear, you know? Because you've never had this happen before. This is a new experience for you. And so therefore we are looking at the West and thinking, oh boy, you know, these poor people, what they're going through psychologically must be shocking, right? So this is the first thing I want to say, get used to it. Get used to it and don't panic because from the Holy Scriptures, worse things will happen in the future. The comfort of the Western world, as it was in the past, is not going to stay forever. It's not going to stay forever. And particularly because of various issues that we can discuss perhaps later, we have unleashed certain forces that are not pleasant. So that's the first thing I want to say, that it is a regional issue that the first world, so to speak, is not ready psychologically for this COVID-19. However, after this thing passes away, you will be stronger people. You will not panic so much in future when other things strike you, when other catastrophes come, you may become stronger as the West African people are. They will take things in their stride. There is no panic here. We're, nobody's panicking. So I think that this is a learning curve for you. I hope it doesn't kill. Uh, I hope it doesn't kill anybody. But if it is to come and it has come, then let it be as least casualties as possible. And may God put His hand to prevent all people from catching it. But at the same time, learn from it as we learn from Ebola, learn from this. So this is my first advice. Don't panic, relax, but be cautious. Be very cautious. Don't permit your heart to palpitate. Do not go through nervous breakdowns. Do not have psychological breakdowns. It, that's the opposite of what you have to do. You have to remain calm, very positive, and wash your hands, wear gloves, and so forth. So that's the first thing I want to say. Be cautious. Be cautious. Take all the precautions that must be there. But psychologically, be calm. Now, why do I say that? Well, 
I believe in the Holy Word of God. And this is what the Bible says about plagues. And can, can I go on, Hank? I don't want you to stop for a second. Okay. Uh, well, this is what the Holy Word says about pestilence. Pestilence is another word for epidemic. So I can use the word epidemic instead of pestilence to make it more applicable. He talks about the Lord. Surely he, the Lord, shall deliver you from the snares of the pestilences. He will deliver you from the snare, he says, of pestilence. Pestilence, okay, of epidemic, sorry, I'll use the word epidemic. And then, and then again, this is in Psalms 91, verse 3, if you want to read it. And then at Psalms 91, verse 5, and you shall not be afraid. Now, that's very important. I want to emphasize this point. You shall not be afraid. You will be cautious, but you will not be afraid because fear will lead you to do the wrong thing. And fear will lead you to bring about other problems that you don't need to have right now. Okay? So caution, yes. Fear, no. You shall not be afraid for the terror. You shall not be afraid. Okay? And then it talks about what shall not be afraid of, the terror by night, nor for the epidemic pestilence. You should not be afraid of the epidemic. Okay. All right. So that's good advice from the Lord. Don't be afraid of the epidemic. Be cautious of it. Be cautious. Because, Brother Hank, if I'm going to live in fear during the Ebola crisis, if I was going to live in fear for two years, I'd be a nervous wreck. And number two, I'd be useless. I'd be shut away in my room doing nothing. I don't want to go anywhere because we've got Ebola. This is ground zero. This was Ebola ground zero here. It, this is where it started. Okay. So what do I do? Do I become afraid and nervous wreck? No. I remain calm. As the Holy Word says, I must remain calm, but cautious. You know what he says, a wise as serpents, but as calm as doves. I think I can't remember the exact word there. Gentle as doves. And then, yes. Gentle as doves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it says here also, moving on, about pestilences, where it says that the pestilence, that no evil shall befall you, befall you. Because of the Lord, no evil shall befall you. Neither shall any pestilence, here we go, neither shall any epidemic, using the modern word, come unto your dwelling. No epidemic shall come into your dwelling. Well, why not, Lord? Why won't it come into my dwelling? For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all his ways. So that's straight from the word of God. I don't know what better I can do than that. Okay. So in those terms, pestilence is nothing new. It's been here before and it should come again. Long after COVID-19 is gone, we will get something else. Uh, long, uh, well, Ebola only went a few years ago. Now we've got COVID. And really, really, Hank, it wasn't just Ebola. We had in the last 20, just the last 20 years, we had swine fever, we had SARS, we had Ebola, we had the so-called mad cow disease, I love that name, mad cow disease, we had AIDS, HIV, we had something called Lyme disease, we had bird flu, let's not forget the people died from that. So epidemics are not something new. We've gone through them so many times before in history, and far more deaths than, than COVID-19. But the main point for us who believe in the word of God, we believe in Jesus, is please don't be afraid. Please trust in the Lord, but be cautious. Now, how do I become cautious? Well, I've got to use logic here with my faith. I have to use logic with my faith. You know, faith and logic going together. Okay. So what did I do in Ebola to avoid Ebola? I wore gloves. 
I tried not to touch anybody, and I gave that advice to all our congregations here in the Orthodox Church here in Sierra Leone. I went around from church to church that we have established, and I would give them that advice. Don't touch anyone, and wear gloves if possible, and try to avoid strangers, people who are you don't know, to try, you know, be friendly, but, you know, don't start touching them and things like that. And, of course, the main thing we did was to keep praying. We kept praying and we kept having church services. This is something I don't fully understand about shutting down churches. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. In fact, that very thing was on the tip of my tongue. What's going on with the church, not only in America, but around the world? In our particular situation, our parishes are virtually closed. I mean, you can go in individually and even receive the Eucharist, but by and large, having church is no longer the norm. The norm is to stay away from church. You're encouraged to stay away from church. You're encouraged to isolate at home. And I wondered about that in light of what you went through with Ebola. I remember vaguely what you told me, but you continued while people were dying in the streets, as I recall, to serve the Eucharist, to take care of the needs of people within the context of all the precautions that you're describing. I believe, brother, in the Orthodox Church tradition, plagues, you know, Byzantium, I just told you there were some plagues in 100 million people during the time of Justinian, and etc. There are others. I won't bother you with them. The church has got prayers for that, and it has processions that we will go around with the cross. Uh, they used to go around Constantinople with the cross and praying. Right now in Greece, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that they are not allowed to have church services, and they even arrested a metropolitan, a hero in my mind, Metropolitan of Kithira, Seraphim, I'm mentioning his name deliberately because I think he's a hero, who had a church service and was arrested. Of course, they let him go, he explained, but he had to conform. He has to conform to Caesar's laws. So I think there are two countries in the world that are in danger who have said, no, we need more church services. And that is Poland in the Catholic world. Good old Poland. God bless them are showing faith in the Lord and Russia, and they are increasing their church services. They're not diminishing them, okay? Because again, during the Ebola crisis, now I'm only speaking on my own experience, okay? During the Ebola crisis, we did many prayers. We did many processions, of course, handed out Holy Communion. No Orthodox died of Ebola. Nobody in the Orthodox tradition here died of Ebola, okay? So I have a hard time But I'm not judging. I'm not judging. We all have different perspectives in the body of Christ on this issue. And I respect everybody's concern about the virus and how it is spread. I understand that. I do understand that. However, there are ways in which we can avoid. Uh, Like, for example, maybe, you know, there are different ways we can safeguard ourselves. But if we stop praying to God, if we stop having church services, the sacramental services, that's contradicting the whole tradition of the Orthodox Church from Byzantium onwards. Now, again, I don't want to judge, and I don't want to go to that direction at all. Having said that, we will do here, uh, we will obey the laws here, but we will, will not stop praying. We will not stop praying. We will continue to do that, you know. But what about the Eucharist? I mean, you were serving at the altar during the midst of Ebola. People were partaking of a common cup in the midst of Ebola, and you say that no one died as a result of that. How does that translate to people today in America, around the world, who are afraid of the Eucharist? who are afraid of the real presence of Christ. I I can understand that. I can understand that. And I'm not going to judge it, okay? I'm not going to come down and say, oh, these people are all a bunch of sinners. No, I'm not going to do that. I can understand it. I can fully, fully empathize with it. 
it's a question of each person must look into himself or herself and decide for themselves. And I don't want to put any judgment upon it. I do what I do here. That is my personal walk with the Lord. Each person has to decide. I can just say this, if I may. In Kenya, I was in charge of a church, just a small church in Nairobi, which one third of the congregation was HIV AIDS. HIV or AIDS, one third of the congregation. And as you know, after the church service is over, the Orthodox priest has to consume whatever remains in the cup. So while you take it first, nevertheless, after everybody else has consumed, you have to consume the whole cup, the whole cup, the catalysis in Greek. Well, I had to do that for a period of time, knowing that one third of the congregation had HIV. Well, I can assure you I don't have HIV. But that again, I don't want that to be translated into all of you, uh, you know, you have to go and you must get Holy Communion. No, I'm not going to say that. All I'm going to say is that was my experience. Okay? So it's up to each individual. Well, whoops. (laughs) That was the familiar Skype sound of disconnect. We tried to reconnect with Father Themi, but reconnecting with West Africa, Sierra Leone, is no easy feat. We were unable to do that. But what Father Themi has communicated thus far is hardly a disconnect. As he was saying before it was so rudely interrupted by technology, there's a mysterious power inherent in partaking of the pure body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, this is the central sacrament of the church. It's the source, it's the zenith of church life. By it, we're changed from human multiplicity to one body in Christ. Within the Eucharistic assembly, within the church, divine life flows into us, and it penetrates the fabric of our humanity. As such, Ignatius christened the Eucharist our medicine of immortality, the antidote against death, enabling us to live forever in Jesus Christ. Life Well, life flows from the one true vine to its outstretched branches. As such, you and I, as the branches are empowered to bear fruit in the midst of a pandemic. A branch cannot bear fruit separated from the vine, nor can it bear fruit cut off from the other branches. The unambiguous point here is that in order to remain spiritually alive in the midst of the chaos of COVID-19. You and I must continuously feed on the body and blood of Christ. For as Jesus put it, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. While there are other graces by which You and I may partake of the divine nature. There is nothing more needful to sustain us in the midst of the present pandemic than the supernatural manna dispensed to us in the Eucharist. Father Themi, as I mentioned in this introduction, is an Orthodox priest who serves the least of those among us, not only in the present, but He has done this for so many years in perhaps the poorest region on the planet. On a previous podcast, he spoke of serving the body and the blood of Christ in the epicenter of the Ebola crisis. His testimony then was poignant and profound. Though people were dying in the streets outside the doors of the church, none who partook of the common cup of the Lord, died. That's a testimony. That's a powerful testimony of the church. It's a reminder that 
we look ultimately to the power of God, not to the arm of flesh. I suppose all of this amplifies one profound truth, a truth which is that you and I as the body of Christ ought not to look to the government as the source of our strength and supply, but rather to God. It is God, not government, that ultimately ensures that not a hair falls from our head without his divine purpose and sanction. It would have been wonderful to continue with Father Themi. He's a dear friend. He's a trusted friend. He's a trusted voice. Lord willing, we will have an opportunity to do that at a later date. But I trust his words, the words that we were able to get, were as encouraging and exhortational as they were to me. I trust they were the same for you. Maybe I can say one more thing before wrapping up the podcast. This morning, I received a call from Elijah Wajaya. This is the very person to whom I dedicated Truth Matters, Life Matters More, the unexpected beauty of an authentic Christian life. And Elijah exhorted me to call the body of Christ to do three things. And I think it's appropriate that I mention those three things as we close out the Hank and Plug podcast. The first thing he exhorted me to call the body of Christ to do is to pray three times a day, which, of course, is precisely what the early church was in the habit of doing, like Daniel, who who prayed morning, noon, and night for restoration of an exiled people of the promise. So, too, we are to pray for God's hand of mercy in the midst of the present coronavirus pandemic. Also, consider praying the Jesus Prayer, in the manner I set forth in Truth Matters, Life Matters More. The Lord's Prayer is chronicled in Matthew 6, is my entryway into God's presence morning, noon, and night. The Jesus Prayer, however, is the means by which I remain constant in prayer throughout the day. It is rooted in the notion that we are to pray constantly, to pray without ceasing, to continue steadfast in prayer. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the Jesus Prayer, simply find it in my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, and make it part of your DNA. The second exhortation that Elijah gave me this morning is to pray three times a day for 21 days. Now, why? It is because, as in Daniel's day, there are strongholds that need to be broken. Daniel not only prayed three times a day, but he prayed and fasted for 21 days. The beauty of praying three times a day for 21 days is difficult to overstate. Just one of the many blessings that you will accrue to your account is that If you pray three times a day for the entirety of three weeks, you will have established an unbreakable pattern for the rest of your days. Thus, long after the coronavirus has run its course, you will have gained a manner of prayer that is life transformational. Last and certainly not least was Elijah's encouragement to pray in one accord. And that accords gloriously with the high priestly prayer of Jesus as chronicled in John chapter 17. I'm sure you remember the words. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Union with God, unity with one another is not only the goal of our salvation, it is the means of global transformation. United to God, united to one another, the authentic church is empowered by an unlimited flow of divine energy to provide life and light to our generation. Divided, the church's energy remains limited and toxic. 
Unity around the essentials of the historic Christian faith is the greatest antidote to the cultural captivity of the contemporary church. The manifestation of the uncreated, inexhaustible energy supply is alone sufficient to save the world. Well, as I close the podcast, a quick reminder that if you enjoy Hank Unplugged, give us a five-star review on whatever platform you enjoy the podcast. And I'm so grateful for all of you who spread the news about Hank Unplugged, who listen to the podcast, and hopefully are transformed by the most inspirational, informative, and wonderful people, people who instruct us in the Word of God and the principles of the kingdom, people who exhort and encourage us to run the race, to fight the good fight, and to finish the course that the Lord Jesus Christ has marked out for us. Thanks for Tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged with my dear friend, Father Themi, I look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Hank Unplugged.